All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second speaker check-in. Thanks for coming today. I expect we'll have a few more people sort of straggling over the next over the next couple of minutes. Um, so in the chat window, which may or may not be turned on for you by default, um, you'll see um, some sort of text and questions scroll past there, but then also over in pound DrupalCon on Freenode in IRC, that would be the, the place to ask questions. Everyone should be muted by default um, just because folks often have background noise, whether it's um, lawnmowers or dogs barking or cafeteria or whatever it happens to be, there is often some background noise. So I have tried to mute everyone um, as they come in. We shouldn't take too long in this session today um, unless we get some really great questions, in which case I expect we will go over by a little bit, but I'll try and keep it fairly short. For those of you who've been to uh, speaker check-ins before, if you've spoken at Prague, you'll know that um, this presentation is the speaker deck presentation. Feel free to drop off if you found uh, the information useful last time, but you don't need a recap of it this time. Absolutely no problem there. All right, so let's get started. And here we go. So today what I'm going to take you through are um, essentially putting together your slides and how to have your slides support your story. We'll talk a little bit about different kinds of session formats. One of the questions that Kathy had asked me was how to facilitate a group discussion. There's not a slide for this specifically in the deck, but I do have different formats. So when we get about three quarters of the way through the deck and we start talking about session formats. Kathy, if you're on, just give me a little uh, hand wave if I don't cover facilitating group discussions, because I can definitely talk about that as well. And then we've also got some information around due dates, but we're not really doing due dates for DrupalCon Prague. Your track chair should be getting in touch with you, or you can reach out to your track chair to um, just go over how your presentation is shaping up and what the um, what the content is looking like, what what you're scared about, what you're really excited about. Um, but we don't have any specific due dates, unlike for um, previous DrupalCon specifically for, I think we had them in Denver and Portland. I think we had due dates for Munich as well. So this is something a little bit new that we're trying um, with less strict deadlines. Uh, and we'll see how the, the session quality fares in uh, Prague and whether or not this was a good idea. All right, so that's what we'll be covering. If I can get my arrows back, there we go. So before you begin putting together your actual deck, you need to take a look at the story you're going to be presenting and the, the proposal that was accepted for DrupalCon. And you need to be able to answer the big question if I can find my pointer to be able to draw on top of the slides, which is sometimes dangerous for me to be able to find. And, ah, okay, I've got a laser at least. So your story is important, but you need to be able to answer the question, so what? Someone coming into your presentation needs to know that this is worth their time and they need to be able to say, um, coming in, this is what I'm going to get out of it. And then when they head out, they have to feel that they've actually gotten something out of your presentation. So this isn't um, just at the end of your presentation, but also the week after DrupalCon, because people are going to be absolutely bombarded with information during the week. And you want them to, as part of your presentation, whether it's just a mental note or they send something out on Twitter or they send an email or they just, they capture in some way that they, want to be able to take action on your presentation. A presentation that isn't actionable is, it's difficult for people to feel excited about if they don't, if they don't know what they're supposed to do with the information. And I've certainly had presentations that I've delivered where it's been a really great presentation, but people walk out of it and they're, they're almost a little bit anxious because they don't know what to do next. They don't know how to implement things. So make sure that in your presentation, you know that before you actually get started with any of your um, any of your story supporting information in terms of your deck. We're going to talk about um, three different things to sort of get things started. I'm just going to shift this my window over here. There we go. 
So the three things that we're going to talk about are, they're, they're pretty simple points, but they are super important to giving a really great presentation. So let's take a look at what those are. The three things are, you are wonderful, your slides give you polish, and remember, people remember you and they remember your lesson. So if we, um, we think about those things as we are preparing our presentation, we can sort of, you know, remember to get a little bit of self-confidence because ultimately you are an awesome person. You are selected to give this presentation. Your slides are there to supplement your story. They give you polish, but they aren't the story itself. And ultimately, people who remember you remember your lesson. So what did I just say? Do you, do you remember the number? Do you remember the visual that I gave you in terms of the number three? Or do you remember what those individual items were? Just in the IRC channel, again, in pound Drupal con, can you tell me what I just, and this isn't, this isn't a test for me, this is a test and a reminder for you as a speaker, what is it that people are going to take away? So I said the information twice with one variation, but I also gave you two different formats in terms of the slide. I gave you one with a number and only a number, and one with a heading with the points. So we've got a couple of different answers in here. Okay, so folks are remembering the number three more than they're remembering those actual actions. And I'm being pinged somewhere. I think it's just in the meeting chat. <laughs> I like to be able to actually answer questions when they come in, but I'm not seeing where this ping is coming from. So I think it's just in the meeting chat. So again, people remembered the number three, but they didn't necessarily remember what those items were. So as you're preparing your slides, think about the visual that's going on and how you can create the hook into someone's brain so that later on, they, they don't just remember the number three, they can actually remember what those things are. So that we can structure the information to be able to put those hooks in place for people. Ultimately, you need to care about your audience and that's the biggest hook of all. You need to be able to reveal your curiosity and your passion. You need to tell preferably a real story about successes and failures. Making a connection to other sessions will also help people to place um, reminders so they oh I remember in that session that it was a little bit related to this session but where you can make those relationships it makes it even easier to remember your story and how it relates to the rest of their DrupalCon experience okay so when we um I think there was things coming in on Skype which is what it was all right so when we um make those connections for people they don't have to do as much thinking. And it's not that people are stupid, it's that they're completely overwhelmed when they're actually on. It brings their ability to memorize things or to remember your session, it brings it down a bit. And many of us will also be jet lagged. Um, certainly not everyone, we expect there to be a fair number of locals, but it, make it easier for people to remember what you're saying and how it relates to their other DrupalCon experiences. In your session, highlight the important things, not just the things that are easy. So the example that I gave you was the number three, and then I gave you those three bullet points. And in a, a couple of seconds, I'll show you different ways to structure your slides that you're highlighting the important information instead of the easy information. On stage, unless you're part of the, at the business day stage, don't sell or pitch your commercial products. This generally for people is an immediate turnoff and they, they don't want to know how to give you money. What they want to know is how to make their lives easier and their jobs easier. Maybe there's a commercial solution involved in that, but the pitch should not be part of, of what you're doing on stage. And finally, slide deck, support your story. Slides are going to enhance your story, but if you have a lot of text, your audience is going to be reading. They are not going to be listening to you. So, and for those of you who are flipping back and forth right now, you're probably finding it really difficult to focus on one thing or the other thing. Should I be focusing on the video and the voice or should I be reading through the slides? So again, the more words you have on your slide deck, the, the more people will listen to you. However, I have personally found that text heavy slides can be used 
if you're reinforcing new vocabulary, you're limited by your visual connection. So a number of people may have the video of me turned off. And in fact, in the recording of this later on, there won't be me in the slide um, as part of the recording because Fusebox doesn't actually record the video. So all there is going to be is this text heavy slide. And then the other place where I found this really handy is when I'm presenting to an audience whose primary language is not my primary language. So in the case of presenting in Europe, I find that for myself, I get really excited and I speak a little bit too quickly. But if there's a text heavy version of what I'm saying available, then people can um, tune in or tune out to the audio and they can still get as much information as possible. I've also had some really good experiences with folks who were visually not able to perceive the slides and they didn't necessarily believe that what was being presented in the deck was the equivalent to what I was saying. They felt they may have been missing out. When I was able to give them a, a consumable version of my deck and they were able to read along with me, it reassured them that the information that others were getting in the deck was the same experience that they were getting in the deck as well. And I'll, um, I now refer to this as feeding the fish and you'll see why in a second. So good slides, as I just mentioned, can be perceived. For every slide, you need to be able to answer this question for yourself or answer these questions for yourself. What's the point of the slide? How does this slide and its imagery support my story? Can someone in the room read the slide? And is it in high enough contrast that people will be able to perceive the content? And especially with projectors, you're going to lose a lot of contrast using a master template that you can easily adjust once you get into your room that you'll be presenting in and test it out means that you don't, using that master slide means that you can put less pressure on your students this, um, this information ahead of time. So <laughs> also pro tip, do upload your slide deck ahead of time to the DrupalCon site, because if there is a problem perceiving your slides once they're on the projector, people can always just download a copy of the slides locally and go through them with you as you're delivering your presentation on stage. One of the tricks that I do um, is I actually, I typically wear glasses and I'll take my glasses off and walk to the back of the room to see if I can read my slides or not when I'm presenting. So I told you about feeding the fish, right? The feeding the fish expression comes from uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And Mr. Rogers received a, the, um, the source for the story is down at the bottom here. He received a, a letter from um, a young girl who all she knew was that at certain points, Mr. Rogers said he was going to feed the fish and then the screen went or the, the experience went blank for her because she was blind. So she had no way of knowing whether or not Mr. Rogers was feeding the fish or just slacking off and doing something else. And so he, he modified his behavior to say to his audience, and now I'm feeding my fish. And now I'm actually describing the experience that people who are um, experiencing the content in different ways will know that it's consistent. So one of the things that I find really difficult in video training is remember to feed the fish in a um, multi-sensory format. So I'm both going to show and I'm going to do and I'm going to tell and give people as much information about what I'm doing as possible. Just as a recap on this, not everyone in the audience will be able to read or see your slides for whatever reason and always describing the content of the slide as best you can without interrupting the flow is great. It ensures that jokes are accessible to everyone. And by jokes, if you have simply a cartoon of an XKCD or the like the Drupal learning cliff example, if you simply put up the joke and let the audience laugh, if someone can't perceive the slide for some reason, they're left out of the joke. So let them know what that slide says or describes or give them an equivalent experience if they're not able to see that information. Templates are required sort of in terms of our decks. And this is a question that comes up frequently um, once they've received the email from staff about the templates available. And what if you don't want to use those templates? The templates are for the AV teams to be able to clip at the top and tail of your session. You don't need to use them throughout the deck. 
but you do please place them at the very beginning slide and the very end slide so that the audiovisual team knows when you've started your presentation and ends when they're fast forwarding through the recordings later on. Um, you did get an email with information about those slide templates and they'll also be available of course for download on the DrupalCon Prague speaker resources page. You can put in a second if you have your own title page you'd like to use. That's absolutely no problem. You can go ahead and put that in as your second slide so that the AV team gets something um, to be able to clip on and then you actually start your presentation and have your real slide in place there. So format your thank you slide using the, the outro or the end template as well. And as I mentioned before, do use a master slide or consistent styles throughout so that if you need to change your slide deck for whatever reason, maybe it's not high enough contrast, maybe the fonts aren't big enough, you can go ahead and do that globally quite quickly. There's a few different ways that you might want to structure your slides if you're using words on them. I gave you the example at the very beginning of the number, number three. Um, so here's a few different ways that you can structure your slides and watch yourself which one you respond best to as a learner. So there's, again, three different ways of doing this. You might want to use all the words, just a few of the words, or just a few of the words in context. When building up my slides, I do want to put information in the center because importance can get clipped off if you put it too close to the edges, whether it's on the bottom or the top or the sides, just sometimes projectors are a bit weird. I want you to use the largest possible font throughout because the room you're presenting in could end up being a lot bigger than you're thinking about or expecting. And as a result, those small fonts that you thought were awesome on the desktop just may not cut it when you actually get on stage. Provide focus within the slide itself. This slide is very difficult to find focus within, isn't it? Laser pours and shadow puppets probably won't work for um, big conference projectors. And a lot of that is because the rear projectors, um, you can't sit in front of them and give shadow puppets. So as fun as that was for me in DrupalCon Chicago, um, I've had to cut it out of my routine. <laughs> uh, do you embed videos instead of using live demos? No one wants to watch you fail. It's tedious, it's embarrassing. Uh, and ultimately, if there's something wrong with your laptop, it's not project, it's not connecting to the projector for some reason, you won't be able to do the live demo anyways, because you'll be on someone else's system. Um, everyone thinks that their live demo is going to go great, because they're awesome. You are an awesome person. But you do not have the opportunity to test your technology with the conference's technology to a point where you can guarantee that it's going to work perfectly. In other words, you're not Steve Jobs. Next one, use images to support your message or not, whatever works, use images or don't, I don't really care, but make sure that they're um, accessible and appropriate. And everyone can participate in your presentation. Assume that there will be at least one blind person in the audience. Assume that there will be at least one person who's using an interpreter um, for hearing reasons. And it's a conversation that you can have ahead of time with the interpreter about how you want to work with them in terms of Q&A and all the rest of it. But we've got, you know, we are an awesome community and we have people who aren't enabled the way that we are perhaps enabled. So be aware of that before you start your presentation. Same information, but I've changed the formatting. I've put my information in the center and I've isolated it. I've used the largest possible font. I've provided focus within the slide by eliminating everything else from the slide. Or I can also provide context. So put the information in the center, use the largest possible font, and provide focus within the slide. So there's three different ways of showing the exact same information. And one gives me everything once and everything at uh, everything without context or everything with context. Which one resonated best with you in um, in IRC or in um, in the meeting chat? If you want to go ahead and from those again, we had three different styles. Which of the three styles resonated best for you? And again, IRC is pound DrupalCon. Did you prefer everything? Did you prefer only the headings or the headings with the context?
Headings with contacts seems to be quite popular. Yep. Great. All right, so let's take a look at some different ways to actually design our slides now. Images can enhance the story, and I think that um, there are great ways to use images, but it can take an awful lot of time to pull those images together and get an awesome set of images. Now you've still got, you know, you've still got some time if you're thinking about this today, which you are because you're watching this recording, you've definitely still got time, but they, they are time consuming. So be, be aware of what you're getting into. Let's take a look at some decks now that are images plus text um, and in a range of different languages. These are all pulled from speakerdeck.com, which I think is a great resource. Um, this one, I love the layout of it. I love the colors. It's nice high contrast for me. Um, being, I'm not red green colorblind, so I couldn't tell you if the pink works well on the black, but I think you'd be safe. One, if you um, might recognize one of Jeff Eaton's slides, so he's got a big heading on there and he's got a couple of images. He has um, a, a contrast essentially between that iPhone and the, the mobile phone, which is elastic to the camera um, with the, the heading underneath if that's a theming issue. Here's one that, that pulls out the code. Now, I personally find in terms of the text along the bottom, if I just highlight that down here, I find the text along the bottom to be, on the one hand, a bit distracting, but on the other hand, it's a quick reference if I want to be able to communicate with my audience in the middle of the presentation, because it gives both the hashtag over on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side, it also gives the Twitter handle. Um, certainly, I would love to get more comments from Twitter back from my presentation at the end, but I'm not willing to put my Twitter handle on every single slide because I think, it, I think it's distracting. So it's something for you to consider how much you want to um, pull the focus in versus not. Up at the top here, I also love um, the, the set in sort of subtitle and also highlighting the code in yellow. This one, on the other hand, is much like the first slide that I gave you of the three different examples. It's got a lot of text on it and a series of logos along the bottom. I don't really know where to look on this. I'm pretty much drowning in text. Um, and I didn't give a source URL for this one just because um, it's always a bit mean to call out bad Slack. I think you can see the difference between, um, between the previous one and this one. There's the same, probably close to the same number of words, but they're just structured in very different ways. And they're, one is, I think, more accessible than the other. Here's another one that has um, some points across the top and then also some code. The thing that I really like about the code in this case, and in some cases, this may simply be the syntax highlighting, but if you've got some color coding within your code, you can easily reference different pieces of the code. So again, it's like the, the third variation where it was the main text plus the highlight. Same thing again here. This is uh, an arrow which is giving the visual highlight so that you can reference when you're actually delivering the presentation. You can say the first arrow or you can say the second arrow that appears on the screen. So again, giving context and showing focus where you want people to, to take a look at the slide. Same thing again, we've got um, sort of fading into the background, the rest of the context, and then pulled out or highlighted the specific piece of information that we want people to look at within the code. So give people that focus and not just a dump of code. There's a few different resources that I would say are pretty darn good for preparing slide decks. Um, I referenced a couple of them last time in terms of structuring or organizing your content. A few of them are the same. So uh, Presentation Zen and Slideology I referenced last time. And I don't think I told you about the cognitive style of PowerPoint. Um, this one, there it is. If it actually, it may be available as a PDF now as well. So this is a um, kind of a classic. It's been around for quite a while. Um, sort of treatise on how to and not to use PowerPoint. 
and um, have it's got some good examples and bad examples of decks that he likes and decks that he doesn't. If if you can if you can track this down, I I found that one to be quite fun um, and a reminder of what's good and what's not. One of the things that it recommends, which I love the idea of, but I've never quite managed to find the time to do it, is to put together a um, uh, I'm trying to think of what the European equivalent paper size would be, an A3. So it's, oh, <laughs> I was going to give you the example of how big it was, and then I realized you wouldn't be able to see my hands. Um, it's it's bigger than two sheets of A4, so I think that goes backwards to an A3, or um, for those of us in North America, it's an 11 by 17. So lay out your all of your information for your presentation on one sheet of 11 by 17, which can be folded up in a number of um, ways. Don't need a staple that way. Um, now, as I mentioned, I always think it's a great idea. I just never quite get around to making those copies before I do. So I do often have a downloadable PDF, which is a supplement to the deck and not just the presentation deck that I'm going to be delivered. And that idea comes from this booklet. Um, and then I've got a couple of different URLs here for examples. Um, the first one is an article about how someone um, puts together their slide decks and it's uh, from a developer's point of view and some of the things that this author has found effective in putting together a deck. And then um, my examples of good slides were from speakerdeck.com, which I've found to be on average better designed decks than on slideshare.net. And then the other one is um, color lovers. If you're needing some help in terms of picking out colors and making things not quite as garish as you might have chosen on your own. I'm horrible for this for sure. Um, Colorlovers.com has some great color combinations, which um, you might find useful in preparing your own master slides. We're going to talk about next um, a few different formats, and I don't think that I'm here who's got panel discussions prepared. Um, this is one of my favorite conferences and I blurred out the, the logo at the top there, but this was literally a panel discussion. It was a founders panel. And I don't know if you can see that's Kieran right there who's about to start trolling and making trouble. And um, Kieran's awesome. We love Kieran, right? Uh, but a panel discussion is really painful. It's painful for the people who are on it and it's painful for the audience members. There's good ways to do it and bad ways to do it, but I think we have more or less limited the number of panel discussions that we accept to DrupalCon. So if you happen to be one of the um, the lucky ones who has a panel discussion, feel free to ping me for suggestions on how to get that right. The next one is a fireside chat. And we saw in Munich, this was the format that Dries used for his presentation. Fireside chats are phenomenal as a way to bring together um, experts without it being a panel discussion per se, or to have someone who's got the expertise in terms of the content, but isn't necessarily confident in their delivery of the information. Putting together a fireside chat where you've got two people having a conversation, and again, they've made it sort of fun in terms of the, the actual chairs here, which you don't need to do for yours. But if you're feeling really anxious or nervous about your presentation and you're planning on being on stage on your own, this may be something that you want to find someone who's already going to be at DrupalCon and figure out how to work up the equivalent of a fireside chat so that you can still deliver your content but without the anxiety of being on stage alone or um, having to prepare a deck that you're just not feeling comfortable about. So I really, really like this format of fireside chat for folks who, for whatever reason, whether they don't have time to prepare or they're actually finding themselves really, really anxious and really nervous about presenting, um, it just, it kind of neutralizes it and makes it a bit more fun. The live demo, um, as I have, perhaps mentioned eight or 12 times before, I am not a fan of the live demo. Um, you do not have access to the technology ahead of time in terms of what those projectors are going to be. You just don't have enough control over the environment 
to be able to succeed like Steve Jobs has succeeded in the past. And perhaps you'll remember for those of you who are Steve Jobs fans, even Steve Jobs has had experiences where the live demo has failed miserably. No one wants to watch you fail. Everyone wants to watch you succeed. So set up the conditions for you to have the best possible successes instead of trying to be risky and prove that you're more macho than someone else. Like it's just, it's not worth it. All right. And um, I did promise Kathy that I would uh, talk a little bit about, um, about how to structure more conversation into your presentations. I noticed that I'm running short on time though. Um, how many other people are in in the core conversation track and would like information on this. I think what I'll do is I'll tack it on at the very end as a discussion instead of doing it right now if it's only Kathy. So we've got it recorded. Um, anyone else? Okay, I'll tack it on to the end. So we cover the information, um, but it's not right here. So remember when you're presenting, you know, when you're getting ready for your presentation, what's your story? You want people to walk out and say to themselves, so what, you know, how am I going to apply this? What, what is it that I can actually do with this information? You need to know what your style is going to be. And we talked about a few different ways of structuring your presentation, both in terms of the visual of the slides and also the experience on stage, um, whether it's uh, pre-recorded screencasts as your sort of live demo bit, um, fireside chat, panels of discussions, hopefully not a lot of that. And then also what's the point of your story? So what do you want people to take away? What do you want them to do? What's the action item at the end of your presentation that people can, they can walk out not feeling incredibly anxious that they don't know what to do for having come to your presentation. So they liked it, now, now what do they do about it? In summary, ensure your presentation has a message or a story to take home and share with others. Ensure every slide supports your message. Ensure every slide can be perceived by the audience. Use any of the formats you like in terms of like a panel discussion or a, a series of slides which are mostly code based or, you know, maybe with a couple of images, but try and be consistent that consistency is going to help the audience stay engaged. And it doesn't mean identical with a boring template throughout. It just means be yourself and be consistent from start to finish. Use the intro and outro slides provided for DrupalCon, please, for editing purposes. This is not meant in any way to limit your creativity within the presentation itself. This is for our audiovisual team who needs to be able to fast forward through the presentations and know where the end of a presentation is and the beginning of the next presentation. It's just that they can cut stuff down. It's not meant to, to in any way limit you. I ask as my um, biggest favor to you to please um, aim to do at least as well as what my presentations have been in the past and perhaps even better than any presentation that I have ever given. One repays a teacher badly if one always remains nothing but a pupil. I encourage you to go and have fun in your presentations, make it fun for the audience, make it engaging, make it the best possible experience that you can make it and, and make it yours. It doesn't need to be um, a mimic of what I have done in the past. It doesn't need to be exactly what you've seen today. It should be yours. And I'm, I would be delighted to help you if you're not really sure what your voice is yet, I would be delighted to help you figure out um, how to do even better than me in your presentation, because I think that's the ultimate compliment to me. Finally, just these slide deck resources again, I quite like Presentation Zen, Slideology, The Cognitive Style of PowerPoint by Edward Tuft. There's a couple of URLs as well. Um, the slides that I had today were all from speakerdeck.com. Color combinations, if you're not really sure how to make something visually not horrible, <laughs> check out colorlovers.com. And then also there's um, a quick little blog post on um, putting together slide decks for developers by someone who was presenting on GitHub. Um, I think that Pat has also posted a couple of resources into, uh, um, into Pound Drupal as well. So we'll try and get those posted on the um, DrupalCon Prague speaker resources page. That's the end of the presentation that I had put together. I'm going to now uh, spend a couple of times 
uh, sorry, a couple of minutes talking about how to engage people a little bit more in your presentations. If you're not needing to do this for your presentation, this is the end of the um, this is the end of the webinar for you. If you've got questions, by all means, go ahead and ask them in IRC. Staff is there to answer your questions as well. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit more about engaging people in presentations. And I will do that by also unmuting folks. If there we go, so I'm going to bring up Kathy. Uh, I am unmuted. There we go. You are unmuted. There we go. So, um, do you have a way of getting rid of the um, speakers? Can, do you put? Do you have a headset that you can put on? I have. Because I'm on. hearing myself as an. Okay, weird. So I'm hearing myself as an echo, which must be a fuse thing. So the, the big thing that I've noticed in terms of engaging people in presentations is that people tend to, at conferences, tune out, even if they're listening to every single word that you're saying. So it's sort of this weird combination of they're focusing so hard that they don't realize that they've just been asked to engage. So one of the things that I've done a couple of times, and I think, Kathy, you were at my Twin Cities presentation on Git and workflow. Yes. So one of the things that I do in that presentation, which I have found works really, really well, is I put a question up on the screen and then I give people the opportunity to work at their own um, their own desk without, without a, a communication component to it. But I have them write down the answers. And I found this works really well to help get people out of listening mode and into thinking and communication mode, but without the conversation being dominated by a couple of different people. So now what ends up happening is it's always the same people who want to answer the questions and share what they have to say, but it gives people who are perhaps a little bit more introverted a fairer shot at writing down some ideas and then being able to deliver those ideas instead of having to think faster than someone who maybe has thought more about the ideas and they're maybe they think that they should be presenting it. <laughs> Not mm. that they're meaning to troll. Um, but I find that that quiet time gives a wider range of answers during the talk back and forth part than if I were to simply jump into, and now let's talk about it. And I also, I've been, if I don't give people that space to have the, con or sorry, to have the, the quiet time, I find that often people just look at me with blank stares. So they're going to, there's going to be a period where nothing happens anyways. So if the instruction is on a piece of paper or type it up as notes in your laptop or whatever you want, or just think about it or doodle it out or whatever it happens to be, spend. And then I give them, whether it's depending on the task, like a minute, two minutes, five minutes, think about this topic, answer this question, and then we'll share the information. I found that works really well for me. Yeah, that could work out well. Uh, and having them write it down on paper gives them uh, the opportunity to write it down in private. Yes. Without yep. uh, having to make it immediately public. Yeah. And you can also confirm in terms of, so you say, and so the first person answers it, and then you can say, how many people wrote down something similar? And how many people wrote down the opposite or a variation of that? And you don't have mm. to have the person say what their answer was, but you can, and they're, all they're really doing is referring back to what they wrote down. So they look at it and does the thing that you write agree or disagree. And then you just do like show of hands, how many people agreed and how many people disagreed. And then you can say of the people who disagreed, um, who's willing to share how they structured their disagreement? Like what was it about the agreement? Sorry, what was it about the disagreement that sticks out for you. You know, maybe it was a technical disagreement, maybe it was a social disagreement, maybe it, I, don't, I mean, depends on what the question is, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, that'll help. Thanks. Cool. And certainly, um, you could have, depending on how you wanted to structure it, you could have those questions that you're going to be asking people available as your sort of, while people are coming into the room, getting ready slide a URL that says, I'm going to be asking you these questions. If you want to jump ahead and start thinking about what your answers are, here's the URL, go and take a look at this blog post or this something or other. 
Yeah. And still give them a bit of time when you actually get there. But again, just giving people more time to think about what they're going to say, I've found is really important in a conference situation or in a group situation where folks, they don't want to make a fool of themselves. Fair enough, right? Maybe it's maybe it's strictly a language issue. Like they're, they have to think about how they're going to say the thing. Um, <laughs> I've had some pretty hilarious presentations that I've given in my second language, which is French, and I'm very, very rusty at. So I, I know what the answer is in my head. I just I have to think about the words to make that answer happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I've had it uh, at least once where <laughs> someone in the audience said to me, like, it's charming that you're trying, but can you just switch to your natural language? Because <laughs> we haven't got a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> so again, giving people more time to think about how to phrase things is generally a good idea. Do other people have tips or tricks? Again, just in um, IRC, or I can also unmute you in the webinar on how they deal with facilitating group discussions, especially when they're for conference presentations. Okay, seeing no others, I assume that there aren't any other questions just because I didn't see any in IRC or in the meeting chat. Um, are there any other questions that folks have? It doesn't look like it. So seeing no questions. Uh, thanks everyone for your attention today. Much appreciated. And if you do have any questions about the format that you're going to be using on stage, or you just want some feedback on the visual of your slide deck, um, or the story that you're, you're putting together, by all means, feel free to get in touch with me either in IRC or on Twitter. I'm Emma Jane HW or by email, Emma at Emma Jane.net. And uh, yeah, once again, thanks very much. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you put together uh, for Prague. I'm pretty darn excited about it. Oh, and the other thing that I highly recommend, um, I've got my little phrase book and I also have my travel guide. So if you haven't ordered your, your phrase book and travel guide yet, be sure to put something together for yourself if you're not a Czech speaker. All right, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.